All right, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the fourth and final webinar um, in our Homeowner Association webinar series hosted by the Regional Stormwater Collaborative of Southwest Ohio and Northern Kentucky. The Regional Stormwater Collaborative is composed of stormwater districts, municipalities, and soil and water conservation districts in Southwest Ohio and Northern Kentucky. The purpose of the collaborative is to raise awareness about water quality issues in the Ohio River Valley. During this evening's webinar, we will be discussing rain gardens and sustainable landscaping. So I do just have a few housekeeping reminders. If you have questions for the presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A feature. You're welcome to use this chat as well, um, but we'll be monitoring that Q&A section feature at the bottom. We will be picking one door prize winner towards the end of the session. We will randomly draw a name from the list of participants. Um, when we reveal that name, let us know you're here and we'll reach out using the email that you logged in with today. Presenter contact information and webinar recordings will be available on the Save Local Waters website, savelocalwaters.org forward slash HOA. So I would like to go ahead and welcome Craig Fry and Elizabeth Fett from Sanitation District Number One. Hi. Hello. All right, hi guys. We'll get started, maybe. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, talking about sustainable landscaping. So what do we think about when we say sustainable landscaping? Typically a lot of people, um, or just in general, think about gardens when, and native areas, very wooly, you know, you're going through a pasture, maybe more so like the one on the, the picture on the right where it's just very unmaintained. Um, things are growing, growing everywhere. Perhaps the plants aren't in the, not in the right spots, that kind of thing. However, what we're trying to go for is more of a, what's on the left with the red, the red house, you know, things that are, um, they're native, plant, native plants, but they're planted in the right spot. So the flowers are very low. So they, they're not gonna interfere with that power line above. The tree is trimmed. It probably won't get too big. So, um, and another thing is just to think about for with sustainable landscaping is you're letting mother nature do all the work or at least most of the work. So you wanna, put in plants and things that thrive in your climate. You wanna think about right plant, right place. Okay. Then the American Society of Landscape Architects defines sustainable landscaping as uh, areas that are responsive to the environment, they're regenerative and can actively contribute to development. So when we think of different types of land, sustainable landscaping, things like rain gardens, which Craig will talk about in a little bit, uh, native planting, so a lot of pollinator, pollinator habitats, so you know, coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, um, I think that like rattlesnake master, those things are all increasing the native, native areas where different animals can exist. And then this, there's a little picture here with the natives and versus, versus non-native plants they have a larger root structure. So it helps the soil. So not just the things that are above the soil, but also below the soil. So that it can help with infiltration, um, providing little avenues for all the cool little beetles and bees and ground bees to live and thrive. So what are some of the benefits? It's long lasting. You're letting mother nature do a lot of the work. They're perennial, typically they're perennial plants. They come back every year. Um, they help reduce water and surface runoff. So this house here on the bottom, you can see a bunch of bee balm growing and it looks like uh, maybe like Indian, yeah. Indian brush, cardinal, cardinal flower, and then the like prairie dock. And so instead of having to mow this entire space, you're only mowing just a small strip of land around it and letting the rest of it be taken over by all these native plants. Another option is to, like the picture on the top, is to make uh, various garden beds. So you don't necessarily have to turn your entire lawn into, um, 
turn it in completely into a large garden, but you can put, use patches here and there. Um, this also helps reduce the use of fertilizers. So mother nature is doing a lot of the work. Everything's working in unison. So you don't necessarily have to use fertilizers or even pesticides. You're bringing in bees and wasps that help take care of each other in the circle of life. So as an example, I wanted to show one of my fr good friends did this in her yard here, just here in Hamilton County, Anderson Township. So we'll start at the top left. So she marked out a spot on this hillside here, took out all of the sod, you know, marked off areas where she wanted to put things or power or lines. And she turned this into a nice little prairie area. So not only does it provide a really, really pretty space, it's on this hillside. So it helps with um, this runoff coming off from the hill onto the driveway. So this garden helps deter lots of water from getting into the driveway, you know, maybe messing up the concrete and things like that. This, is, this picture is shown at year two and there's some cover crops. So that's also helping break down the soils, a lot of the clay soils that we have around here. And another example in her yard, she did this too. This is just along the walkway. As you can tell, there's plenty of space for her dogs to run around in the yard, but these are just like little pocket gardens. So you don't necessarily have to go, you know, full bore everywhere needs to have a garden. Start small, do what you can do to main, and then, you know, you can always go big. And then here are just some of the animals that you can, that she's had come to visit her different pollinator gardens. If you see on the bottom right, there's a little box turtle, there's some swallow tails some bees and some moths. So not only does it bring the bees and butterflies, but it'll be bringing in the birds as well. Um, so if you're an avid birder, she's she's always has tons and tons of cool birds hanging around. So you've done all this work. Now you want to show it off, right? So hopefully we're convincing you that it's a doable you, and here are some different resources that you can use to help you along your way. So one of those is the Monarch Way Station. So here in Covington, they actually, the mayor has a, I think um, we're, Covington's a May, Monarch Way Station city because it has so many different way stations. Um, but if you go to their site, you can see a list of different requirements and then you can get yourself a plaque and also, um, speak to other people about building pollinator gardens. So another society, this is more focused on bees and, and other pollinators. Uh, you can do, they have the same type of program. You can go to their websites. They have different lists of um, plants you can plant and then also looking at um, for specific to your area. So, and if you want to upgrade all of that, once you've gotten the small gardens, you can get yourself uh, certified as a wildlife habitat. So not, this not only provides nesting areas and feeding areas, but it also provides shelter, uh, places to raise the young, food, water, all of this. So birds, squirrels, you know, um, turtles, and other animals can live and thrive. And so actually I'm gonna show you on the um, wildlife habitat page, this native plant finder, it's really neat. So I'm gonna pop out of this, I'm not sure how to do this. Pop out of this and show you the website. There it is. So you can go to this native plant finder, type in your zip code and it'll bring it'll populate it with all the different types of plants and shrubs that you can use within your that is specific to your area and say you wanted to plant you know a crab apple your bradford pear is on its way out you want to put a nice native crab apple you can click on it it might take a second <laughs> Um, and so then it'll give you information. 
about it, what types of animals it attracts. Um, and then so you can you can start designing your rain gardens or your your small garden using these tools. Um, I'm also going to bounce over to the Cincinnati Zoo website. They also have a great resource page on their native plant program. So we can pop over here and just go down to the native plants. And so say you're looking for, uh, I don't know, Craig, what, what are we going to look for? <laughs> I thought a red bud. A red bud. So we're going to look for a small tree. Maybe you have some power lines, so you can't really have a very large tree. You can pop over here and look through, and it'll give you all this information. Say um, this apple service berry. So service berries are great because birds love them, and it'll give you all this information to so that you can use when you're designing your garden. And hopefully. It's it goes along with the HOA rules too. Okay. So the zoo is here. Hey, Liz, oh, Liz, we do have a question real quick why that's coming up. Yeah. Um, so the question's from Susie. Um, Hi, Deer can be a problem in my yard. Will the native plant finder note deer resistance or are there other sites? Uh, I. I don't know exactly, but it it may. Um, I didn't look too closely. I, I think that it might. We can take a look. Okay. I just wanted to bring that up since we were yeah. leaving, we were right there. So sorry yeah. I missed you. Oh no worries. I know my mom has trouble with deer all the time. They love they love all her plants. <laughs> so it is a it is a good thing to look out for. Um I would yeah, I think I would I it may have that information, but if you end up liking a plant, maybe you can take that name and then go to another site and see if it has any deer resistance or maybe um, plant it and see what happens. Uh, so another great resource to help you is the Cincinnati Nature Center. So they have this home habitat resource and so you can look through and they, there's different links to help you if you want to attract more birds or more butterflies, things of that nature. And if you haven't been there, you should definitely check it out. So, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Craig, who's going to talk to you more about rain gardens and how to start a type of sustainable landscape. Hello. Thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, we're going to get into DRIP. Uh, this is a disconnection redirection infiltration program. We put this together, SD1 Sanitation District number one put this together a few years back. And it's basically guidance documents on how to disconnect your downspout, redirect your downspout, and either install a rain barrel or a rain garden or both. So we're going to walk through the disconnection downspout piece. Um, there's definitely steps you need to follow, um, which we'll get into. And again, you can just disconnect and allow the water to run off into your yard, or you can tie that into a rain barrel um, or a rain garden. And what we've seen in the past is we've actually had rain barrels that are discharging into the rain garden as well. So you can plumb it all together if you, if you choose to. So I am going to pull up SD1's website. Um, and on our website, we uh, have this, all the guidance documents that you will be able to find to, um, I'm just gonna show this real quick. So yeah, our website, and the links are on the, um, I think Sarah's gonna be posting the links, so um, you have access to all those. But this will be the link. And again, on this website, SD1's website, we have the um, guidance documents on how to actually walk you through um, to do how to do these things. So starting with the downspout disconnect, these all work together. You know, you got to disconnect your downspout before you do anything. So what is a downspout? Um, it's, if, you, if you're not familiar, I'm going to start basic and then we'll, we'll graduate into more complicated things. But a downspout is a um, pipe that drains your roof and drains your gutters basically. And they either take it and discharge it out into your yard 
or they put it down into the sewer system. So why is on our end, SD1's end, um, where the stormwater authority in Northern Kentucky, um, if their downspouts are discharging into your sewer system, we wanna get that water out if we can. Because especially in the combined sewer area, um, where the sewer systems are carrying both stormwater and wastewater, if we can reduce the amount of stormwater getting into them, so if we can take that runoff coming off your rooftop and keep that water out of the sewer system, that benefits us because it won't, that water from the rain and the rooftop can overwhelm that sewer system. So if we can remove that, that benefits SD1. So that's the reason why we would like to have downspot disconnected. Um, but as a resident property owner, um, for you to benefit, and you know, you can just actually use that water for watering plants or whatnot. So that's why you would be interested in doing that. So the first thing you need to look at is, will it work on my property? Will it work on your property? You can't just go cutting downspouts and you know, hoping that things will go well. So what you need to consider is when you cut your downspout, it has to be six feet away from your foundation because you do not want to be putting that water down into your foundation because you're just going to create issues for yourself. Um, you want to be about 20 feet or so away from any roads. Um, we had the city talk to us when we were first developing this program um, to get their feedback on what they thought a good requirement would be for the discharge uh, length. And they said, keep the water 20 feet away from the roads and sidewalks because we don't want to be putting water onto the roads and sidewalks, especially in the winter um, and causing uh, freeze and causing potential uh, hazards. So 20 feet away from road sidewalks, uh, you definitely don't want to flood your neighbors out. So make sure you're good five, six feet away from your neighbor as well. Um, and what you want to make sure that you do um, is if you're, you met all our criteria, you're 20 feet away, you're five feet away from your neighbor, six feet away from your foundation, you need to make sure that your yard is suitable to handle that you know, excess water um, because you are taking some impervious surface that that water, that that, that uh, yard did not handle before, and you're adding that runoff from that impervious service into it. So a good rule of thumb here is you can see this calculation down here. So assume your roof is 50. Um, Craig, I'm gonna stop you for a second, sorry. Um, yes. We're just seeing a slide that says rain barrels. Okay, well, let's figure out why we're doing here. Oh, I think I know. Does that help? Much better, thank you. Right. So <laughs> what, what I was getting into is downspouts and um, you gotta make sure that your site is suitable to handle a downspout. Um, so I'll get into the calculations since you already heard the spiel about staying away from your foundation and your neighbors. So this is a sample calculation here. So assume that your roof is 50 feet long and 30 feet wide. That'll give you a 1500 square feet of rooftop. That makes sense. So let's assume that you have four downspouts at your home. So you'll take that 1500 foot square roof, divide that by four, that'll give you 375 square feet of drainage area per downspout. Does that make sense? I don't see any nods, so I'm assuming that that makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you have 375 square feet per downspout. So you wanna take 10% of that. Your yard needs to be 10% of that 375. So you would multiply that by 0 0.10, and that would give you 37 square, roughly 37 square feet of yard to handle one downspout coming off a 1,500 square foot roof. Again, um, the guidance documents are there, and feel free to you know get on there and walk through it yourself so you like really fully understand um, that calculation. Because again, this calculation is going to build on. We're going to build onto this calculation with more with the uh, rain garden. So it's going to this calculation will continue to to grow and get a little more um, detailed. So once you've determined that you have 37 square feet of yard to handle your 1,500 square foot roof, um, how do you actually do the disconnection? And these next few steps will walk you through how to do that. Um, I would recommend there's again the guidance documents talks about and shows you all the different tools you may need. Um, you probably won't need all these, but it's a good uh, reference point to go off of anyway. So if you are, there's multiple ways to get that water out into your yard. Uh, you can either put a flex hose on and connect that to the downspout, or you can put like a, a hard elbow 
um, like a guttered elbow or downspout elbow on and get that out to yard. So depending on what you want, the flex hose or the elbow, um, I would recommend taking that hose if you purchase it and putting it up next to the downspout before you cut it and actually bending it in shape and, you know, showing you can simulate exactly how it's going to look. So that'll give you a good line of reference of where you need to actually cut your downspout. So once you figure out that, that elevation, that height that you're going to be cutting your downspout, then you would actually go in and cut that downspout um, with a um, hacksaw or whatever tool you want to use. So once you cut it, um, typically majority of downspouts in older homes anyway, they go below ground. They go into these uh, storm sewers like I was talking about earlier. So you remove your downspout from this, you know, you're going to have a gap, you're going to have a hole. You, you need to make sure that you plug that with um, some sort of plug. And they sell hose clamps and also sort of things at the local hardware stores. So make sure you plug that up before you do anything. Um, Cause the last thing you want is something to happen, something to fall in there, um, whatever may happen. So once you plug up your, um, your downspout, your standpipe there, then you would attach your, again, either your flex hose or your elbow. This photo here is illustrating an elbow and I have a flex hose in another photo, which or illustration, which you'll get an idea what the flex hose is if you're not familiar with that is. Attach your elbow flex hose and send it out six feet again from your foundation. Um, and you may need to put in a splash block. Um, I've seen folks put in decorative rocks um, just to kind of make, give it some aesthetic peel, appeal. Um, so whatever you choose to put in. Once you get that in, get it established, um, you definitely need to watch it the next time it rains um, and observe your property because you know you could have you could thinking that your water is actually be your, your water is being directed to the spot that you um, want it to be, but it could it may not be being directed there. So you got to make sure it gets directed to the right spot and that there aren't any issues that may be um, happening. All right, is your downspout disconnected? It's draining to your yard and things are good. Now we're going to bounce to a rain barrel which is again, an ex extension to your rain or your downspout disconnect if you choose to. Um, so same rules apply for disconnecting. The only difference is um, you're not gonna be cutting that downspout, you know, two feet, one foot off the ground. You're gonna be cutting at the height of your rain barrel or slightly above your rain barrel. So you gotta make sure, first you need to check with HOAs. Um, you gotta make sure that you're allowed to have rain barrels. Um, I know some ordinances don't allow rain barrels, but others do. Uh, so that's first and foremost, but then you pick, you need to pick out a rain barrel that suits you, suits your yard, you know, gives you a nice appeal that, you know, you would like, um, you know, you see these food grade barrels that are installed, you know, they're not the most attractive thing, but you know, they serve the purpose, but so it's on, it's exactly on what you want, want it to look like and, you know, how you want it to, how you want the to function too. So there are a ton of rain barrel, different rain barrels out there. Um, save our local waters. Save our local waters, yes. They can tell you all about rain barrels. So I definitely look into that um, information, the links that they have and resources they provide for that. Um, but back to that elbow versus flex hose, here's a illustration of the flex hose. Um, they're actually, I, I kind of prefer these because they're actually easier to work with. They're not as, you know, they don't look as nice and as clean as an elbow, but um, they're a lot easier to get things installed and, and directed the way you want them to. So you bought your rain barrel, you decided on the height that you need to cut, you decided on the flex or the elbow that you would have put into it. Um, you assembled your, your rain barrel, now it's time to install it. And again, it's pretty basic. Um, you attach the hose, you stick it into it. Um, most rain barrels, if not all, have an overflow because rain barrels typically are only 55 gallons. So they will fill up pretty quickly. Again, you're only, you know, putting 375 square feet into it, but um, these things will fill up, you know, given an, an inch of rain. So you need to make sure that rain barrel has an adequate overflow orifice that will allow that water to get out. And I've seen rain barrels in the past that had the same size orifice discharging out that was coming in. So there wouldn't be any backup. Now, again, Actually, this down here illustrates that. So this bottom photo or illustration will show you that you got a four inch flex coming in, a four inch going out. 
If you can find a rain barrel that has that same configuration, that's great. But either way, um, there are multiple configurations now that work just as well um, that don't have this, you know, the same orifice coming out. Um, so again, choose one that works for you. Um, choose one that looks good. Choose one that you'd be proud of and you actually maintain and take care of. Once you get it all installed and most rain barrels, again, if not all, come with installation packages and they walk you through on actually how to install the rain barrel, also how to assemble, assemble it and then how to install it. So it should be easy, pretty easy process. Um, same, same thing, uh, once it rains, go out there, watch this thing. You, you wanna watch this thing fill up. You wanna make sure it's discharging out to the same spot. Um, and if you're good to go, you're good to go. Um, you can, I've seen folks winterize these, um, some by just taking them in and they they saved that, that downspout piece that they cut out originally and they reattached that, or they just added a flex hose to it and just put that out like a just a normal downspot disconnect. I've seen folks keep rain barrels out all winter. Um, it's all dependent on what you want to do with that. So now we're going to jump to the rain barrel or sorry, the rain garden. Um, this can get, this is going to be obviously more steps, more, a little more complicated, uh, a lot more involvement than the downspout and the rain barrel. But um, same thing, start off with, you know, your downspout disconnect. But what you need to really spend a lot of time on is will this thing work on your property? And a lot of things go into this, you know, again, this ties back to sustainable landscaping and like Liz was saying, you know, if you have beds in your, in your yard that you've converted over to, you know, sustainable land with, you know, pollinators or whatever, uh, you can use these downspouts to feed these things. So they're not typically, what Liz was speaking to, they're not typically considered rain gardens, um, but you can, you can still use that downspout discharge to, to help water these, um, those gardens. But the rain garden itself, that's a little different animal here. And you want to make sure that before you go just again, we're starting from square one before you go disconnecting downspouts and knowing that you want to install a rain garden. You need to survey your yard, you need to make sure that you have a decent space, a low line splay space, you know, if it's a low depression that's great. Um, you don't want to be underneath a tree, you don't want to be near foundation, you don't want to be near your neighbor, you don't want to be near um, well. You don't want to be within 10, 20 feet of that road, that sidewalk. Um, you want to make sure that you don't have a ton of utilities underneath you. So you got to walk the yard. You got to think about things. And basically, you're walking through a checklist and seeing if that rain garden will actually work on your property. So once you've determined that it will, then the next step, again, before cutting a downspout, is to do a uh, simple infiltration test. And... There's multiple ways to do it. This is the way that I've seen is the easiest. And, you know, it's relatively accurate. Um, again, we're not, it doesn't have to be exact. You know, it can be pretty close is good enough. So, but with this infiltration test, basically you're gonna dig a hole that eight inches wide, eight inches deep. You're gonna fill this thing up completely with water and let it soak for a couple hours. Um, you wanna saturate the, the soil that's around there before you start measuring this infiltration because you'll get a false infiltration rate if you just immediately start measuring how quickly the water's infiltrating um, because it's currently drying out the soil and that's what, that's what you don't want because that's not giving you an infiltration rate. That's just, um, that's just soaking up the, the dry soil that's down below the ground. So once you have hydrated that soil, then you actually see how the water is gonna allow that water to flow through the soil during wet condition. So you dig your hole, you fill it up completely, let it sit for I'd, four hours or so, I'd say at least, and then you fill it up again. And if you're in a hurry, you can have this test done in eight hours total. But I would recommend to fill it up, let it sit for four hours, fill it back up and let it sit for 24 hours. You don't, let it you do, you don't have to let it sit for that 24 hours, you can just let it sit for six you just have to multiply your result by four to get to that 24 hour period. So you wanna see what your rain, you wanna see how much water will infiltrate out in a 24 hour period. The 24 hour period is kind of the golden standard on rain gardens. You don't want water standing, you do not want water standing longer than 24, 30 hours in a rain garden. 
um, you're gonna you're caught you're gonna cause some issues with the plants um, potentially mosquitoes if it's getting to the 48 hour you know whatever so you want that thing to drain down in 24 hours so once you filled it up you've let it allowed it to hydrate you fill it back up you wait 24 hour period then you measure how much water has dropped in that 24 hour period so that'll give you your infiltration rate and with that infiltration rate, you will need that to determine the depth of your rain garden. And you'll see a note down here, residential rain gardens should be at least eight inches, uh, but no deeper than 12. So we will take this, we got infiltration number now, we'll take that number and we'll start adding and calculating the size of a, the rain garden that we will need. So we ended on that infiltration, I'm jumping ahead real quick, but on the infiltration rate, um, we averaged eight hours, or sorry, nine hours, <laughs> nine inches in 24 hours. That's what we, that's what we managed. Once we did our filtration rate, we averaged nine hours, nine inches. But this calculation shows us being lazy and cheating and only doing it in four hours um, instead of the 24. Again, I'd recommend 24. So, but let's go back up to our calculation that we started with the uh, uh, downspout disconnect. We have the same square footage of a rooftop. Um, we have the same amount of downspouts, four. So that will give us, again, 375 square feet per downspout discharging from your roof. Now, we're going to add a little twist into this. Um, we're going to add 75 feet of square footage of a patio draining into your rain garden as well. Now, Typically, that's not the case, and I rarely have seen it the case where you're, you know, calculating patio, but I think when we're developing these guidance documents, we just kind of want to throw in a wrinkle just to make folks think about, you know, there may be other impervious surfaces getting into this uh, rain garden. You know, it may not be a patio, it could be a sidewalk, it could be your front, your driveway, whatever it is. So in this scenario, we have our 375 square feet rooftop, we have 75 square feet of patio. Um, which is going to give us a total of 400 square feet of impervious surface. So with that, we're going to take our nine inches of infiltration rate and we're going to divide that by the four, um, 450 square feet of impervious. And it's going to give us 50 square feet of rain garden. So we need an area in our yard that's 50 square feet to handle that runoff coming from the rooftop as well as the uh, patio. Okay, so you, you need to build a rain garden that's 50 square feet. Now, you'll see in this diagram down below and even down below this, um, you don't want your rain gardens to be wider than they are longer. You want the length to be longer than the width, probably by double. You want kind of a peanut, peanut shape, similar to what you'll see here. And the reason being is, as your water is flowing into that rain garden, it's gonna have room to travel uh, and meander down through the rain garden and then eventually get out through the back. If, imagine this thing being flipped and you know you got your rain garden sitting long ways here, uh, width ways, then you know that water is not gonna have enough that travel room. You're not gonna get your stormwater benefit. The water is gonna potentially get out a lot faster. Your plants aren't gonna thrive because the plants that you're putting in there need that, you know, that water to, you know, sustain. So we recommend, and everyone else recommends, building rain gardens, kind of a peanut shaped, the longer versus the wider, give that water that time to get through, um, or give that water a chance, an area to get through, I should say. So another thing you need to do too, on the back end of these rain gardens is to kind of build, berm them up a little bit, because you do want, I mean, the idea is to hold the stormwater in here. You don't want the water just to, you know, sheet flow right through the rain garden to get out. You want to dam it up, berm it up, and allow the infiltration to do what it's there to do. You know, it's, a, it's, it's infiltrating the water coming off your impervious surface, and it's putting it into the ground, and it's, it's keeping it out of the sewer system. It's keeping it out of the street. So let's use nature. Let's use the sustainable landscapes to infiltrate um, that water and keep that water out and put it back down to the, the ground and the water cycle. So... What I didn't mention, I'll do here, actually, step three, let's do that. Um, if your infiltration test is showing you, you know, eight inches or greater, that's great. Um, if it's not, um, there's a good chance you may need to amend your soil. So 
and that means basically you need to come in, scrape off, you know, four or six inches of that native soil and add, you know, amend it with soil or amend, amend it with a sandy mix, amend it with a topsoil. You know, you're creating an infiltration with that amended soil. So um, what we recommend is once you get your rain garden dug out down to that desired depth, again, our rain garden is nine inches deep here based on an infiltration, um, watch it, let it rain or take, take a hose and fill it up, you know, and see what happens in 24 hours. If the water's gone in 24 hours, you're good to go. If the water's kind of still standing around, you know, then you may want to get in and amend it. It's best to do the work up front if you need to amend your soil versus coming in after your plants are in and, you know, then you're pretty in pretty bad shape. You're not going to have, you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, we won't be able to really amend if you already have the plants already installed. So, Doing this work up front is uh, highly recommended. So say you amended it and you added that soil and then you got, you got your infiltration, you've watched, you filled it up with rain, things are working great. Now it's time to plant. And I personally like to, you know, kind of make my own design up. I'm not a landscape designer by any means, but I like to try different things. And, you know, for the most part, things have worked out. Some things I've kind of messed up on and Wish I had a better design, but you know, for the most part, they've they've turned out okay. If you are one of those folks who aren't able or not capable, you know, really not sure of designing it yourself, then you know there are many websites, um, resources out there that will walk you through step by step on how to design a rain garden. And they're actually, I would definitely, if you're interested in doing one, if you're going to do one, I definitely recommend reaching, you know, looking out these resources and finding these uh, different rain garden design um, options that they have. So our rain garden design, we know exactly what plant we wanna put in there. Um, now, how many plants do you need to put in? And again, this can be, this, this information can come from that design that you, that you got from, you know, raingarden.com, design.com, whatever. Or if, you, if you're doing it yourself, here's just some, you know, sample calculations on how many plants you may need. Um, 50, you know, one plant per square foot, that's pretty aggressive. You know, that's a lot of plants. That's 50 plants. And that, uh, I think this is based on quartz. I don't think this is, these are one gallons. Um, I like to put the one gallons in because, you know, it's instant rain garden. You don't have to, you don't have to wait a year or two for me to establish <laughs> their at a kind of big and beefier looking. And, you know, I, I think they can get established better if they do have a, a nice amount of root on them. So, um, but then if so, if you don't do the one foot uh, per plant square, you can, you know, base it on a one and a half plants per square foot, which will give you approximately 33 plants. So once you got it planted, you know, we are going to watch this thing again after it rains. And there's been a handful of times where we've had to go in, once we got things, once we had a dugout and had it going, we let it rain, it looked good, but then we came in and planted it and put our plants where we wanted to put them. Well, by doing that, we kind of threw things off and we for, were forcing, by accident, we were forcing the water to one side or the other side, which, you know, you don't want that to happen. You definitely want to get that water to disperse throughout the, the middle of that um, rain garden. So you may have to go in and adjust things, a few things, once the plants are in and level things off or kind of recreate some berms or whatever. Um, and I also recommend, it's hard to see in this illustration, but I also recommend right at the entering point of your rain garden to put in some rocks to help with that flow coming in, kind of diffuse it, dissipate it, and like allow it to a nice, easy entry into your garden. If not, you could be looking at potential erosion issues coming up um, and washing some of the plants out potentially. But again, you don't have a huge amount of impervious surface coming into it. So you, you probably won't get like, you know, these big gully washers coming in to blow this whole thing out. But, you know, you will get, you know, you got four inches of pipe draining a roof. So you will get, you know, a good amount of water coming into this. So once that's all well and good, you know, everything's good to go. You are, you're, you're up and flying and, you know, things are fine. Now, as far as maintenance goes on rain gardens, you need to get in. Obviously you need to trim, prune as, as needed. Um, but every couple of years, they recommend that you get in, put a fresh layer of mulch in on top of it. 
Um, that's your choice if you want to do that or not. I, I recommend at least the first the first round. Once you get things established, throw some mulch on there, uh, pine bark, pine straw, whatever you want. Um, some some of the stuff floats more than others. I've seen people do the straw because it doesn't the pine straw because it doesn't float. It's not buoyant, so it stays put. Whereas like mulch could potentially get pushed and float to one area, whatever. But definitely put on some um, a cover a cover top. Um, for the first year or so, allow things to get going. But then once once they get starting to get established, and they're going to be dropping, you know, you're going to have leaf litter and whatnot. So they're going to be kind of creating their own mulch uh, moving forward. So you should not have to come back into mulch, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Okay, with that, I think we have covered all the rain garden and rain barrel stuff. Um, questions so yeah we are going to open this thing up to questions um and feel free to fire away all right so don't forget if you have questions you can use the q a feature at the bottom or you can type it in that chat box as well um, but before we move on to questions i'd like to go ahead and announce our door prize winner um so dennis clement if you could let us know if you're here um that would be great and also, I just wanted to um, circle back to that one question, I think, from Susie. The zoo's webpage actually uh, states whether the plants are deer resistant or not. So if you want to check out the, na the zoo's native plant program on their website. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> um, Susie said, thanks, Liz. Oh, so yes, that answered her question. Excellent. I see Dennis, we're going to give you a couple more seconds to let us know if you're here, and then we're going to go on to the second person. Hey, Craig, this is uh, John here. I had a quick question for you. So what is the, um, so when you are when you go ahead and disconnect the downspout and you, um, uh, you know, you've, you've got that splash um, rock or the, um, the decorative rock, what purpose does that play for the uh, disconnection? Uh, it helps uh, dissipate the energy of that flow coming off your roof. So again, you got 375 square feet of roof, but then you also have that eight, 10 foot drop of downspout. So that water's coming out, you know, a pretty good clip. So as it e exits out that pipe, you know, if you can put on some sort of rock or that splash guard, the water wave will hit that and dissipate out and not uh, erode, potentially erode um, where that water is discharging out. So basically to slow down the water as it's getting into your yard so you're not creating any erosion issues in your yard. Thanks, Greg. Yep. All right, we never heard from Dennis. So um, Jennifer Hughes. Jennifer, if you're here, if you could let us know. Thank you. All right, let's see. Okay, we have a question. Um, what is one of your favorite flowering native plants for rain gardens? <laughs> well, you got to go with milkweed. I mean, that's, it's such a, it's pretty, but it's just the benefit of the milkweed with the monarchs. I mean, I, I got to, hands down, it has to be milkweed. And there's several different types. So you can do a swamp milkweed, which is a nice, really delicate pink pink flower. Indian hemp is also really good. They're all good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called Indian. All right, thank you. And you want to kind of, I guess, but as you're designing that, you know, you want different heights to your rain garden. You don't want the same, you know, 24 inch plant growing throughout the whole length of your rain garden. You know, you want to throw some height in there, different dimensions. I see folks put in big boulders, um, which is pretty neat. Um, even, you know, hardy, hardy plants, um, woody plants, I should say, not hardy plants, woody plants, some do well, um, but definitely, you know, mix it up. Don't just have one level plant, you know, get some different height, different, um, different looks. So. Okay, we're going to go for a third try for a door prize winner. <laughs> Okay, this time it's John Whedon. John, if you could let us know if you're here, that would be great. Okay, and we have another question um, from Scott. 
Um, what do you think would be a maximum slope a yard could be and still have a rain garden? How steep is too steep? Great question. Um, again, you can build the largest berm, the largest dam on the back end of that thing if, if you want. If you really, or if you really heart is desire to have rain garden in your yard, uh, as long as you can build that up and dam it up, and you could get away with it. Obviously, as you're building that dam up, you know you're going to have to excavate that that garden out um, to you know not make it such a great slope inside of it. But your yard, um, honestly, I don't know what would be a good one to three potentially. Um, I've been lucky and not had to deal with any slope issues. Ideally, you wouldn't want a sloped yard, you know, but I think uh, I've seen, um, don't quote me on it, but I think I've seen a one to three is a pretty good ratio that you could, you know, potentially have a successful rain garden on. But again, again, you can, if you have the engineering ability, you can engineer just about anything, so. Maybe tear it, start terracing it. Terrace it, yeah, I should could. Yeah. I mean, you could even, you know, put some larger, real large boulders up front that will really dissipate that water and allow that thing to, you know, just allow the water to gradually enter into that garden too. So you can get creative. Um, but obviously I understand you don't want to be putting all this work in and all of a sudden that first rain, to come, rain event comes in and blows everything out. I, I get that. So, um, but I would, I would research that a little bit more. Um, but I think the general rule of thumb is one to three. All right, we have a little memo from Janine in our chat box. Um, she would like to thank um, Liz and Craig. Um, and I guess she is in Indiana. Um, so she's gonna do some research on Indiana resources. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, depending on where in Indiana you are, um, some of it, some of these resources can definitely transfer. And like I said, the, the certified wildlife one, you just put in your zip code and it'll bring up what is um, pertinent to your area. So that's really helpful. And you're quite welcome. Yes, glad you could attend. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go on to our fourth door prize winner. <laughs> Sorry, it's not because they're not here, um, they're government, so they can't accept them. Uh, um, so the four, fourth person on my list, um, was Janine Allen. So Janine, we know you're here, so I will reach out. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, John and Dennis, thank you, um, for, um, for kind of disclosing your, your status as government employees and your inability to take that prize. We appreciate the integrity there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Liz and Craig, did you guys have anything else to add? Nope. No, just remember, you know, progress over perfection. Take your time, uh, do what you can, reach out. There's some resources. I also added some resources of local companies here that you could reach out to, maybe get design quotes or just um, native plant sale information. So like the zoo and the, Cincinnati Nature Center sell uh, native plants, as does AIM and Nursery in Northern Kentucky. So. Yeah, and our I think our contact information may be up on, feel free to reach out. Yeah. Um, we're here to help as much as we can. I do think that our guidance documents that we have on our website, SD1's website, are very beneficial. So mm -hmm. um, have at those if you choose. But yeah, get a hold of Liz. She'll love to, help, love to be happy to come out and help you out. Yep. Will do. Well, thank you again, Liz and Craig. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, we hope you learned something new. Um, so as previously mentioned, um, the webinar recordings, additional resources, and contact information are all on the Save Local Waters um, website, savelocalwaters.org forward slash HOA. Um, give me about a week to get that this recording up there but everything else is already there. Um, and we would like to wish everybody a safe and healthy holiday season. And we wish, we hope you have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.